You're watching LMCC. Thank you so much for coming out, like you said, and braving the cold. You guys are the true Minnesotans, and I hope that you will also be at the starting line of the Klondike here in about a month, regardless of what the weather is like. Um, I want to just kind of share with you a few things um, about myself and my story, along with the history of racing on the lake. And there's a couple reasons that I want to do this. One is that setting up kind of my own history and my own story is what's going to lead in to the founding of the Klondike Dog Derby. And also, my story is a pretty typical story of what I'll call a sled dog family. Uh, the world of sled dog racing is very much a family sport. And some of the things that you're gonna learn as I tell kind of the history of how my family got into it are gonna give greater context to you in terms of understanding the sport that I wouldn't be able to kind of sew into the history of the sport on the lake here. Here's kind of what I'll walk you through is my story. And then we have the history of racing here on the lake, which is really a four part, part history. We have Klondike Day in Excelsior, which was in the 1930s. We have sled dog racing in Excelsior in the 1970s. And then sled dog racing in Mound in the 90s. And finally, the Klondike in 2020 and beyond. And then I'm going to share at the end a few sort of pieces of history of the sport as a whole. So you kind of have three concurrent histories here. You're going to see some overlap. And what you're really going to learn is that this is a very small world. <laughs> everybody kind of knows everybody and there's all kinds of really fun and interesting connections that I'm going to be able to point out. So yes, my name is Bethany Way. I have a graphic design business in town. My kids are ages two, four, and eight. We spend a lot of time up north in Ely where my husband and I both grew up and uh, I decided to found the, dog, the Klondike Dog Derby, which was maybe my craziest idea but also probably one of the most things I've ever been privileged to be involved in. So I'm going to kind of start telling you about what it was like to grow up in the sport. Uh, my parents were both born and raised in Chicago. Um, they decided at a certain point that it would be a great idea to get out of the city, and they bought a horse farm in Rockford, Illinois. There they boarded horses, and my dad actually showed Arabians. You can see him over there on the far left. They were very much into kind of recreational sports, things like that. And so one weekend they decided to go to a state park called Rock Cut State Park outside of Rockford, Illinois. And there they saw sled dog racing for the first time. My dad was bitten by the bug, so to speak. And the very next weekend they hopped in the car and they headed to Green Bay, Wisconsin to watch another sled dog race. There they met Don Balan, who's this musher here in the middle. He is a world renowned sprint racer. And at the time he was just dominating the sprint racing scene. When I talk about sprint racing, those are short sled dog races. That's like three to 15 miles. Well, it was about a month later that my parents had traveled from Rockford, Illinois, up to Ely, Minnesota, and visited Don's kennel, and there they purchased a, sl a sled dog team. So from watching the sport to having a team of sled dogs was about a month. Pretty soon, their uh, outdoor riding arena was full of sled dogs and they had traded the horse trailer for a dog truck. Here you can see my mom. She raced in the Ely All-American race and I think she placed second in that. Um, pretty soon my parents were spending weekends racing in Illinois, Wisconsin, um, Michigan, and as far away as Saranac Lake, New York. At one point my dad actually won, he told me this, the fourth state regional sled dog championship. So they were very much into it and they decided to make a change to better reflect their love of this lifestyle and they moved to northern Minnesota in 1985. There they ended up purchasing a resort up on Lake Captogama near Voyagers National Park and they were very uh, active in kind of the sled dog community in the area. But over time that resort got busier and busier and so eventually they sold the dogs. But it was not before I got the privilege of experiencing the first few years of my life being born into a mushing family. I literally learned how to drive a sled before I learned how to ride a bike. My mom tells stories of being pregnant with me and being out there taking care of the dogs. I was bundled up and put in the sled for below zero rides. 
I learned how to carry an ice cream pail and go out and give the dogs water. So I have some really fond memories of those early years before they made an exit from the sport. The trouble with sled dog racing and sled dogs in general is that you can kind of check out, but you can never leave. And so a few years later, we visited Don Bland's kennel again. And there I fell in love with a sled dog puppy. And for the second time, my dad left Don Bland's kennel with the beginning of a sled dog team. Because what good is one puppy, especially one sled dog puppy, when you could have two, three, four? Pretty soon we were heavily back into the dogs. I was in my glory. I was raising puppies. I was helping to um, train the sled dogs. And pretty soon my parents had decided to start a business running out of the lodge that they had recently built in Ely. And we started guiding dog sled trips up into the boundary waters. There I got to meet tons of interesting people who were coming to go on tours. Someone took a picture who was on a sled dog trip and I ended up on the cover of the Japanese World Traveler magazine. We had no idea. Someone said, oh, I saw Beth on the, this magazine when I was traveling internationally. So kind of a fun <laughs> surprise. <laughs> um, this recreational form of mushing was really enjoyable. There was no pressure to it. We were getting to introduce people to the sport. Like I said, raising puppies, really having a lot of fun. And then one weekend, my dad decided that it would be great to just see how these trip dogs, these recreational dogs, would do in a race. So he entered them in a race in Wisconsin, and as a surprise to himself and the rest of us, he won that race. Well, that reignited the competitive spirit in him once again, and pretty soon the races became more frequent and longer and more competitive. <laughs> Pretty soon our kennel of 50 recreational dogs had become 85 dogs as he was acquiring more and more racing dogs. Now racing dogs and recreational dogs look about the same, but the difference is that the racing dogs are bred and trained for speed and endurance. And uh, you know, I wasn't complaining. I had more dogs to love on and pretty soon I decided that I would try my hand at racing. And you know what, it was a lot of fun but I realized that what I really enjoyed was what's called handling. So handling essentially means that you are the pit crew at the stops on these longer races. So I'm gonna to refer to something called distance racing. Distance racing is anywhere from like one to 300 miles and beyond. And that's what my dad started becoming very competitive in is this distance racing field. So he was running races um, here in the Midwest uh, on the North Shore at the time there was a race called the Grand Portage Passage. And then there's the famous John Bear Grease Sled Dog Marathon. Those are both around 200 miles. He also um, ran the UP 200 in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, the Can-Am Crown in Maine. And he was winning many races and consistently placing in the top five. I was racing along with him at times. Sometimes we'd have two teams in a race. That was really fun, but like I said, it was this handling that was really interesting to me because this was sort of the tactical side of the racing. I, I had to think about the care for the dogs. I had to think about how we could most quickly get them rested, get them rehydrated, get them fueled so that he could get back on the trail and ultimately cross the finish line first. Uh, I think it, that side of me is kind of what has really fueled my enjoyment in terms of planning the Klondike because it's, it's really more the strategic tactical side of the sport. Um, my dad's always saying like, are you gonna race it one year? And I'm like, I don't know, maybe, but I really like the planning side of it. Um, so eventually all of this racing kind of leads to one place if you're in the sled dog world. That is what we call the Super Bowl of the sled dog world and that is the thousand mile Iditarod Trail sled dog race. So my dad had been watching films of the race since the 1980s, and those films kind of led to like, hmm, that might be interesting to do, kind of a dream, kind of a goal, kind of a, hey, I registered for the 2002 Iditarod. <laughs> All right, so that was definitely a family affair. <laughs> Needless to say, uh, I was heavily involved, as was my mom, and we were like I said, training dogs, which when I refer to training dogs, I mean, that is, you're up at three in the morning, you're loading your team of dogs into a truck, you're trailering them somewhere, you're running for 50 to 100 miles with them, 
then you're really caring for them, giving them massages, giving them supplements, feeding them really, really high quality meat, which you need to walk in freezer for that meat, you need meat saws, you need to be grinding the meat. It is a full-time job. <laughs> oh, oh, and then you have to pack for the Iditarod. So this took place months before the race. Um, what you see here is what we call drop bags. They have the name of the different checkpoints on them along the race. On the left, you see we were starting boxes for each of the checkpoints. And he's starting to pack those round things, our sled runners that are all bound up into a circle. Uh, we have bags of dog food. There's dog booties. There's fuel for him. There's dry socks. There's, I mean, more than you can possibly imagine. And also what goes into this is strategizing, because he needs to plan where is he going to rest and where is he going to maybe blow through a checkpoint. So it takes a massive amount of uh, just pre-planning, uh, work to get to this point where your bags are packed then they're put in shipping crates sent to Alaska where they are then flown by what's called the Iditarod Air Force to multiple checkpoints along this thousand mile trail so that when he rolls up with his team of dogs he finds his pass and anti bag he opens it and he has everything he needs to complete his rest there because there's no general store Maybe there's a general store, but they certainly are not going to have enough gear and supplies for the, you know, 50 to 100 mushers that are coming through their community. Well, once the packing was done, the training was done, in February of 2002, we hopped in the car and drove to Alaska with 20 sled dogs. Needless to say, that was a very long road trip. Um, when you have to stop and let 20 dogs out at a rest area every four hours or so, it takes a while. It was really fun though, and probably one of the best memories of my life. Um, once we got there, I got to meet the heroes in the mushing world. This here is Jessie Royer. Jessie is registered for her 20th Iditarod this year. She is an incredible woman. And right next to her is Susan Butcher, who is kind of a legend of the sport. Alaska actually has a annual Susan Butcher Day. Susan Butcher was the second woman to win the Iditarod in the 80s, and she held the speed record for many years. I wanna say, I have it written down here somewhere, uh, 1986 until 1992, and she was consistently beating her own speed record. So she was highly competitive. She liked to give the guys kind of a hard time and just a really wonderful representative of the sport. Sadly, she passed away from cancer in 2006. Uh, once we got to Alaska, my dad started the race in Anchorage, and shortly thereafter, my mom and I flew to Nome, Alaska to wait for him and he finished the race in 11 days, 7 hours, 36 minutes, and 42 seconds. While I was in Nome, I uh, was spending some time with some of the locals there. You have to stay with a host family because there are like, it's like one hotel with a few rooms that uh, people who are spectators get to stay at, so you stay with a host family. And this woman said, let's go watch the dog teams as they come, you know, off the Bering Sea. So we went over, out, um, beyond this sign, which I don't know if you can see it, but it says travel beyond this point not recommended. She said it was no big deal. It was night and we got to a certain point and she said, oh, I think I'm going to turn around here. I think I missed the point where the teams come in off the Bering Sea. Well, this, we're in the tundra. There are no trees here. And the road is one just windswept white everywhere. And very quickly her truck went from road to just snow and we were stranded on the tundra. It was about 50 below zero, and it was probably around midnight. And we got to walk uh, back to Nome, about five miles. Um, we were fine, but uh, you know, my dad, when he heard that story after he got off the race, he said, we gotta go take a picture by that sign. I did get to see some amazing northern lights, though, so it was well worth it. <laughs> um, after my dad finished the Iditarod, he joined a very elite group of people, as less people have finished the Iditarod than climbed Mount Everest. Um, after the race was over, uh, I graduated high school, and I came down to the Twin Cities to go to college. My dad, having accomplished his dream of running the last great race and having lost his training partner, soon thereafter decided to sell the dogs. Well, this was kind of bittersweet, I say that, because half the dogs went to my brother-in-law, Jake Way, who's pictured on the left, and he quickly started um, chili dogs, sled dog trips. So now whenever I visit my in-laws, I get to see some of the grand puppies of that original Iditarod team, 
And you all, if you want to, can go up to Ely, Minnesota and go on a sled dog ride with chili dogs. Um, now, I, I reminded you guys, I think I said this, and if I haven't, I'm going to say it again. It's really hard to get out of sled dog racing. So not so long after my dad had sold the dogs, he was given an invitation to be a race marshal at the UP200, a race that he had won previously. And so that was his re-entry back into the sport. Pretty soon he was spending weekends in the winter race marshalling at races that he had previously run, uh, like the UP200, the John Bear Grease uh, Sled Dog Marathon, and the Wolf Track Classic up in Ely. And to this day, he still race marshals up at Bear Grease. This is him and I at um, Trail Center checkpoint last year when he was race marshalling there. Well, it was in 2018 that I was watching live coverage of the Bear Grease. Just Hey, wanted to see dad, you know, what he's up to up there. And I was looking out the window of my office, which is a street over on second. I have this little tiny view of Lake Minnetonka. And I kind of got that familiar itch, which I hadn't felt in a while. And I started remembering what it was like to grow up in this sport. I was seeing some of my friends competing at the race. And I thought, okay, there's no way that I can get back into this. I live on a third of an acre, not very far from here. My husband would probably think I was crazy and might leave. Um, so getting sled dogs was out of the question, but I thought, I wonder if there's a way that I could bring this sport to my community. And I started thinking about what it'd be like to have a sled dog race here, and the problem was like, where are we gonna run these dogs? I mean, the Twin Cities is notorious for not being consistent with the amount of snow that we get. But then I looked at that lake out the window, and I thought, well, there's my trail we're going to have ice. I mean, if we don't have ice in February, then we have bigger problems in the world, right? Um, so I figured, I bet we could do it. If we could run a race around that lake, we can make this happen. And the UP200 is a race that starts and ends on Main Street in Marquette, Michigan. And I could picture, in that moment, Water Street filled with spectators and sled dog teams heading out. So the first thing I did was I texted my good friend, Bill Damberg who Bill is also a client of mine. I do a lot of work for Brightwater. And I said, Bill, what do you think? Am I crazy? He said, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so after that, I shared the idea with my parents. And about a week later, my dad called and said, oh, yeah, I talked to Gary Roderick. He raced in Excelsior in the 70s. I was like, what? So this idea is not even a new idea at all. And that was the moment I knew maybe we were onto something because suddenly it wasn't just the idea of bringing a sled dog race to the area. It was an idea of we we're bringing a piece of history back to life. And then I started Googling. But the funny thing is that I didn't first find any information about that race in the 1970s. I actually found a picture of what was called a dog derby in 1937. And it was called Klondike Day. So now I'm going to share with you, not necessarily in chronological order as how I found it, but this is the chronological order of the history of sled dog racing on the lake and in this area. In 1937, the Excelsior Civic and Commerce Association, along with the WPA Recreation Project for Rural Hennepin County, presented Klondike Day. This was a winter carnival, and it featured things like ice skating, a masked uh, skating party, snow modeling. There was, of course, the uh, crowning of an ice queen. I think I have a picture of here. There's the ice queen uh, and a dog derby. So this dog derby was not exactly what you see now in terms of the modern, you know, a team of huskies. It was kids and their dogs and, of course, a whole lot of fun. Uh, and this is something that was actually happening regularly at snow, at uh, ice carnivals throughout the city. So uh, the St. Paul Winter Carnival had the mutt races around Como Lake, and then there was the Tribune Dog Derby that was happening in Minneapolis. Right here on the left, this was the first picture that I found. This is Annette Coburn of Excelsior, who was the repeated winner of the Tribune Dog Derby. Here she is in that race. And she's posing with her dog, Tribune, after winning the racing event during Klondike Day at Excelsior's Winter Carnival. Uh, that event, as far as I know, was pretty short-lived. I found uh, historical records for 1937 and 1938. That is the event that we borrowed our name from. And um, we, I mean, 
if we were not totally crazy, I would love to say, hey, let's add some of those other things. Wouldn't it be fun to have snow sculptures in the commons and a masked nighttime skating party? <laughs> All right, so we're going to jump forward 40 years to the next sled dog racing event here in Excelsior. In the 1970s, the Greater Excelsior Area Chamber of Commerce uh, in partnership with the North Star Sled Dog Club, decided to put on a race that they called the first annual sled dog race. This race was held down in the commons and out on the lake. In town, you could buy a Hug a Husky button from a local shop in Friendly Excelsior. They were also serving bratwurst and kraut sandwiches with hot cider and coffee. Hooray, Excelsior is going to the dogs. Uh, you can see the original Hug a Husky button up there, which someone actually found for me at um, the antique store right here on Water Street. Kind of fun. Um, and we are even kind of recreating a slightly different version that we're going to be handing out at our Hug a Husky event on the Friday before the race. So this race, uh, there were 68 teams entered, and the total purse was $300. Teams were racing out to Big Island, and around Smith Bay and Lafayette Bay in a variety of courses going a variety of distances. There were several classes in this race from the 12.5 mile, what we call open class, which means you can have as many dogs as you want fielded, to the 1.75 mile junior race, which attracted 34 young mushers. There were a few really interesting characters uh, who were competing in these races that year. Uh, one of them was Chuck Gould of Eden Prairie, who was a pretty well-known racer during the time. He grabbed a whole bunch of his neighbor kids and he entered them in the youth race. One of the young men who was in the youth race is Dennis Laboda. Now Dennis went on to be a pretty well-recognized distance racer living in the area of Hovland in northern Minnesota. Now here's one of those fun connections. Dennis's son, Kurt, is registered in the 2022 Klondike Dog Derby. In 1973, the, one, the man who won the Open A class was Mike Murphin of Big Lake, and he was running a team of coon hounds. Other mushers said, you won because your dogs were barking so much that the rest of our teams were shying away. <laughs> Another man who was entered in that 1973 race here in town was Tim White, who went on to enter the Iditarod in 1974, and he's the one who developed the quick change runner system. So when I was pointing at those rolled up runners, that's something that was developed by Tim. Previously, you would have to take this big, huge piece of plastic off and sand down your sled and like re-wax and heat up the runners. It was a big ordeal. Tim's system means that you can essentially rip them off, slide new ones on a rail, and you're good to go, which is great, especially if you want to be, you know, have a really fast sled. And some of these races come down to seconds. And so if mushers are able to change those, those um, runners out, not so much on this type of race, like a 40 mile race, but on a 100 mile race, you're certainly going to be changing out runners between runs. So we had some really great people who were here racing in the 70s. The next race was held in 1973, or sorry, 1974. That was the second annual sled dog race. Uh, there were 70 teams and the purse was up to $435. Um, trail preparations during these years were usually a problem. You can see here, the, this is a trail map. And you can see Excelsior, you know, going out to Smith Bay. You can see there's multiple different routes. Some of the things that can cause problems on a trail on a lake are things like overflows, um, we have pressure ridges, uh, there's also fish houses and ice roads and snowmobiles. Um, also people out walking their dogs, um, having either pets like near the race or near the trail can be really problematic and distract a team or be a danger to the pets. And some of those things that were challenges then continue to be modern day challenges now just in terms of keeping the teams safe with like snowmobile traffic is something that we really have to be cognizant of and you know preparing a trail like the guy who our trail boss I mean he probably spent a week making circles around the lore like over and over and over and over again to make sure that it's really like packed and um, defined out in this sea of white 
So these, these pr uh, problems that were presented to them are very familiar to our team. Uh, the, the racing disappeared for a few years, but in 1980, the T Butcher Block restaurant have played a prominent role in bringing another race to life. I believe that they, oh yeah, they upped the purse to $1,000. And uh, Chuck Gould, who I mentioned before, he's the one who brought a whole bunch of his neighbor kids to the youth race. He was prominent in bringing this to life. Uh, he was the one who was doing the trail grooming. We also have this picture here, which is quite blurry, but that woman is Sally Bear. She raced in that race, and she is the one who really helped to compile a lot of this history. She was racing in the 1970s in the 90s on the lake. She knew all these people, she was there. So there's a lot of her firsthand knowledge and her stories that are part of this whole presentation. We are so grateful. Last year I started doing some of the history and she contacted me. She had known my dad and she heard we were doing this and she said, I can help you work on that history. So I have huge thanks to Sally for putting um, a lot of this together in terms of just those that background information. That's a picture of her in the race in 1980. After that, it would be 15 years before sled dog racing would make a comeback on the lake. In the 1990s, the North Star Sled Dog Club joined forces with the Northwest Tonka Lions Club out in Mound to hold a series of races in the upper lake. A lot of these races were, I think they were run out of like what is now Surfside Park. Uh, in 1995, the purse was substantially increased to $3,500. And there were 65 teams entered in the race. Here you can see, this is Gabe Havrila, who is running a pair of standard poodles in the ski joring competition. He garnered a lot of attention for that. Uh, in 1996 was the year of what Sally told me is called Prancer's Perils. So, oh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Dave Hockman had a dog named Prancer, and at some point at the start of the race, Prancer escaped her handler and took off for parts unknown. Well, she was missing for 10 days, and at some point, I think Dave kind of gave up hope and went back to Canada, where he's from. But there was a family out in Independence who one day walked into their barn, and there is a sled dog. Now, they probably would have just thought that this was any old stray dog, but they had been at the race and they had seen this dog get loose, lucky for Prancer. So they knew who to contact, and they contacted the Sled Dog Association, who got in touch with Dave, who was very thrilled to get Prancer back. And here's another fun connection. Dave came to the Klondike in 2020, raced, and won. So he is our champion and he's coming back to defend his title. So when I read that story, and I, Sally wrote this before the 2020 race, when I read that and I was able to put that together, I'm like, what a cool thing, right? All right, in 1997, the race was canceled. It seems that there was plenty of snow, but it fell too early. So then you kind of get those like not really great ice, it's kind of slushy, kind of the dangerous overflow conditions. So a year later, it was in 1998, with a purse of 7,500, that we got uh, what would be the last race until the Klondike. Kind of something interesting also happened at that race. The racers showed up on race morning, and they were greeted by a DNR official who said, there's some unsafe trail conditions because there's been a fish boil. Now my first thought is like, Door County, has anyone been there for the fish boil? That's not what he meant. He said that this is what happens when a bunch of fish congregate and cavort in the same place and they thaw the ice. I am wondering if anyone has heard of this because this sounds crazy to me. I don't know what, maybe he had a bonfire with his friends there or something. I don't know what happened. Um, but at any rate, because of the fish boil and the warm temperatures, all classes had to run the same 3.5 mile trail two days in a row. Um, Sally pointed out that it's really interesting to look at the time differences between like a 10 dog team and a three dog team running the same trail. If you're really interested in that, it is available on our website under history. There's a PDF you can download and I mean, there's so much more information in there that you can dig into, it's kind of fun. So after the 1998 race, we're gonna jump ahead two decades to 2018. Remember, that's when I sent Bill the text 
Well, the next person I reached out to is Dr. Jackie Pipcorn, who I had known growing up, growing up because she is a very famous sled dog veterinarian. Dr. Jackie has been a sled dog vet at every race. And I mean, literally has, you know, she was one of the ones who knew me when I was like way down here and my parents were racing. Um, I knew that she owned West Tonka Animal Clinic. I'd bumped into her in the area before. And I thought that she might be a good person to reach out to. Well, I found out after she called that she had actually taken part in making the races in the 90s happen. And not only was she very enthusiastic, but she had a colleague at her clinic who had grown up in Alaska, uh, Dr. Shane Smith, and he was really excited about the race and wanting to help out as well. So pretty soon after, Bill, Dr. Jackie, Dr. Shane, and then my dad from afar were meeting, weighing in on this, can we make this happen? Ultimately, I mean, we have met almost every month since January of 2018, uh, along with a few others. <laughs> Pretty soon, we were all bringing a friend, and we had enough to form a board of directors and a 501c3. We set our goal for 2019 for the first race. We were about seven months into planning when we realized we would need a little bit more time to make this happen. So that was when we decided that 2020 was the year. Plus it sounded kind of fun, right? All right, 2020, inaugural race. We had so many logistics <laughs> to coordinate, including getting permission from Water Patrol to run a race on the lake. Uh, Bill and I petitioned our city council to shut down Water Street, fill it with snow, and take over the entire parking lot with sled dog trucks. They said yes. <laughs> I'm glad they did. So. Convincing mushers to come to the Twin Cities and race is a whole different story, right? If you can imagine driving a sled dog truck down, you know, 694, uh, it's a little bit of an ordeal. Uh, but lucky for us, we were able to raise a good purse. So we went from, what was the last race? I think I said it was 7,500 in 1998. Well, we had 25,000 in 2020. Uh, we also had a team of experienced officials, so people know my dad, Stan, people know Dr. Jackie, they know me, and they kind of felt like, I can trust this group. I, they're, they're not going to just, you know, make up a race that's not safe. And then we also eventually had um, Amy Flackney join our board of directors. She's a local musher, and she really is, she's our musher representative. She provides a voice for the mushers. She's able to advocate for them and kind of say, you know, maybe that's not what they would prefer. We want to make sure that we're giving them a really good experience. Uh, as well as making sure that our spectators and sponsors are taken care of. But first and foremost, if the mushers aren't happy, we don't have a race. Uh, Bridgewater Bank stepped up as our first big sponsor. And they were one of the ones who really helped us make sure that we could have that purse. Pretty soon after, we had both large and small businesses stepping in to support the race in a big variety of ways. Excelsior Brewing hosted our first fundraiser, which was amazing. That was like the seed money to make this thing happen. Uh, we had Hewn and Forge build a beautiful, huge race arch. I don't know if anyone was at the event, but it's this massive, like, 14-foot tall timber race arch. Uh, Ostrom Creative did our branding. We had, you know, many other people, including uh, over 500 volunteers putting in, like, close to 2,000 hours of time surrounding the race to make it happen. And that day dawned quite snowy and beautiful. But somehow, it all came together. We had 29 mushers, and it was truly a magical day. That snowstorm that we had on the morning turned into bluebird skies. The race went off without a hitch. The crowds were fantastic. The board was elated and exhausted. It was really an amazing day for our community. We tried to bring a race in 2021, but due to COVID, we had to cancel. We did not skip a beat or a meeting. We just kept on working towards the 2022 race. Uh, this year, everything is coming together beautifully. We are super excited. We have 35 mushers registered. That's a full race for us. And we have a $40,000 purse. We cannot wait to present this to you guys. Now, this is the story of the Klondike. But I want to share a few more snippets with you that I think will kind of broaden your horizons. This is a pretty tight focus on one geographic area. So I'm just going to share a few more kind of tidbits. All right, do you guys remember that I talked about two different breeds of dogs that competed in the races? There were the coon hounds and the poodles. In the 80s, there was a man named John Souter who became famous for racing the Iditarod 
with a team of standard poodles. He not only finished the race, but he placed a respectable 38th out of 52 finishers, and then he went on to compete the race for the three following years. Well, the Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Committee said, uh-uh. <laughs> Soon after, they created a rule stipulating that only northern breeds could race. They pointed out that the poodles were unable to complete the race. Some of them had to be dropped at checkpoints due to frozen feet and hair matting issues. So it was really for the welfare of the dogs. Yes, maybe they could finish it. They are, after all, you know, I mean, they're a sporting dog. But they're not bred to do that. So by saying that only northern breeds, that became really the standard, and that is in our race rules as well. And when I refer to a northern breed, I'm going to tell you two things about northern breeds that are really fascinating. Uh, these are the things that make them incredibly suited and adapted to, to the sport. One is that they have a double coat, so they have sort of this soft, downy under coat that keeps them warm, and then they have an outer guard coat and that is essentially like waterproof, windproof, <laughs> and that's what protects them and keeps them, you know, I mean, there was recently a post on Nat Geo of a sled dog like burrowed into the snow, and they're, they're perfectly warm. You bring them inside and they are panting. They want to get outside. They're too hot. The second thing that's really interesting is that northern breeds have a very unique circulatory system that runs down their legs and into their pads that help, helps keep their legs flexible and keeps their pads at just above the point uh, where tissue freezes. And the way that that system works, I mean, I'm not scientific, but I've read about it. It is amazing how the blood is like cooled and then warmed so it doesn't reshock the system when it comes back up. So these dogs are adapted to the lifestyle. Poodles, not so much. So that's why you will see um, huskies, uh, you'll see Malamutes, you'll see Siberian huskies, you'll see what's called the Alaskan husky, which is not a pure breed but it is a mix of different husky breeds over the years. Another very interesting thing is that in 1932, the Olympics were held in Lake Placid, New York and included sled dog racing as a demonstration sport. Canada's Emile St. Goddard beat America's Leonard Seppala. Some of you might recognize that name if you've watched the movie Togo with Willem Dafoe. That was a recent movie by Disney. Now, Seppala, He's the one who owned two of the most famous sled dogs in history, Balto and Togo. Both of these dogs were used in the famous serum run to Nome in 1925, which included over 120 sled dogs, no, 150 sled dogs, 20 mushers, running 675 miles over the course of five days to bring a uh, antitoxin to the community of Nome, which was on the break, uh, the brink of a developing diphtheria epidemic. It was a pretty incredible thing, and that is what is the inspiration behind the Iditarod sled dog race. Both of these pictures are on Front Street in Nome. Uh, this was from the Serum Run, and this is the finish of the Iditarod. So the Iditarod was founded to commemorate the part that sled dogs play in the history of Alaska, and also to save essentially the trail it's this historic trail that's running from Seward to Nome. Uh, over time, as snowmobiles were coming, becoming more and more popular, Alaska was seeing this way of life, the sled dogs way of life, disappearing. And so in the 1960s, there were two people who worked tirelessly to bring uh, the Iditarod to life. Those are Dorothy Page and Joe Reddington Sr. They founded the race in 1972, but it was in 1973, also the year of the first race in Excelsior, that the first ever long distance trail race in Alaska was born. And I would like to point out another fun connection that Joe Reddington's grandson, Ryan, raced at Klondike in 2020, came in third place, and he will be back again this year. So we really did draw some of the best of the best in the, com the racing community. Uh, that is all that I have in terms of the history, but I want to give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions, and thank you again for coming out. <laughs> and if anyone wants to get involved in the race, there's plenty of ways, and you can find out more either by looking at the, I put rack cards out, and there's also information on our website. 
the Klondike will be February 4th and 5th. The fourth is our Hug a Husky event on Friday. You can see sled dogs getting veterinary checks. You can get a ride in the commons. And then the Hug a Husky event is where you can actually meet all the mushers and hug the huskies. And then on Saturday, that's race day. So that's where we have the opening ceremony. Teams are leaving the start shoot at two minute intervals. So you really get like over an hour of time where they're heading out onto the lake and then they make two 20 mile loops and they come back here and finish. And then there's an awards ceremony right on Water Street at 5 p.m. On February, February 5th, it's a Saturday. Mm -hmm. You probably have some uh, 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 good advice on how to keep her feet warm in the wintertime. <laughs> your feet. Yeah, so the question is how do you keep your feet warm in the wintertime? Yes. Uh, well, for one, get good socks, wool socks, and really having um, great boots. I mean, some of the boots that, I don't think I even have pictures in here, but the boots that we would use when we were really like training and out there in the Boundary Waters for 100 miles uh, would be from Cabela's and they look like moon boots, right? They're, they're really well insulated, they're waterproof, they're gonna keep your feet warm and dry. I have some boots, um, I'm blanking on the brand. I got them up in Grand Marais during the Bear Grease last year. My feet got wet at one point and I immediately went to town and bought new boots. And I went for a walk yesterday. I mean, it had to be, I don't know, well below zero. And by the time I got back, my feet were sweating. I think they were like Kamek or something. They're, but just a really well insulated boot that's gonna keep you dry with one good pair of wool socks and wiggle your toes. <laughs> Where are the mushers from this year? Like, what's the farthest away? Yeah, so the question is, where are the mushers from this year, and what's the farthest away? We have mushers coming to us uh, from Alaska. We have several coming from Canada, all across Canada. We have mushers from Colorado, Michigan, Wisconsin, obviously Minnesota. Um, there might be a Montana team coming. Kind of all over, yeah. What's the background or the history of the plan? Come ye, come ha. Yes, the question about the background between it's come G, come ha. That's a great question. I know, so I, I feel like a lot of people, because that is on our branding, what does that mean? Well, G and ha are commands. That's how you drive the dog team. So you say G to turn right and ha to turn left. And with a really, really good leader, you can be out on a lake, like I referenced the Boundary Waters, nobody's breaking trail out there. So you are out on an open lake and you can say G and they'll turn right. You can say G over and they'll go over a little bit to the right. So it's pretty amazing when they're like really trained and like well tuned to the driver. Yeah. Uh, what does a race marshal do? So the race marshal is the keeper of the rules. Um, Surprisingly, there's a lot to keep track of, especially when you have that much money on the line in terms of making sure that everything's fair. Um, example would be we have mandatory gear that everyone has to carry in their sled. So they have to carry, on this race, they have to carry a, an ax because it's really hard to hook down a dog team when you don't have a good like snowpack. So they need to be able to literally chip into the ice and set their snow hook, which is like their break, in case they need to go work with their dogs. Well, you know, they might, like, he's gonna make sure that they have an ax that's capable of doing that. Not just some lightweight ax that's gonna check the box, but that, like, the safety requirement is being met. Sometimes there dis there's disputes on time. Um, we had an issue the first race where the teams got out of order back in the parking lot and I was standing there and I'm looking and I see bib number 15, bib number 17, where's number 16? Now this race comes down to seconds. So we had to make sure, we had like, I mean, had to run and go get 16 and by the time he got to the start line, his start time had already passed. So we just said go and we were able to tell our timers who were standing there, keep track of how much you know, time has elapsed well, all of that needs to be verified by the race marshal, right? Because guy number two who came in like sec, I mean, the time difference was seconds between their teams. Uh, they, he wants to make sure that this is a fair call because there's like $2,500 between first and second place or something like that. And also just the prestige of like, he really thought he won. And so those are the things where it's like, you need that kind of like referee to make sure that it, it stays fair, yeah. Can they use 
microchips like in um, with runners? And also, how many teams did you already say teams are coming in? Yeah, okay, so two questions. One is can they use microchips like for running? And how many teams? The easy one is there will be 35 teams this year. Those other races, you were hearing big numbers, right? Like 60, 70 teams. Um, we just frankly don't have that much room. <laughs> the, the rigs are really big, um, so that's how much room we have. Um, yes, kind of. So there's a few different ways that microchips play up a role. One um, is not in our race, but it's interesting, so I'm going to share it. In the Iditarod, all of the dogs are microchipped. So at every checkpoint, you know, we're making sure that like this is the same dog. Not that people would do that, but people would do that. Um, it's happened before. <laughs> so the, the dogs are all required to be microchipped for that race. Um, in terms of the tracking, in the Bear Grease, all the teams have a GPS unit on their sled. And that's partly a safety thing on a race like that. I mean, you are in the wilderness. And if somebody goes missing, takes a wrong turn or something, to be able to see where their team is is extremely helpful. Um, here, the teams do have uh, a chip on their sled. And then they pass a point. We use an event company that does like running and cross country ski races. But we have multiple forms of timing. Again, because of how much money is the on the line for them, it's a big deal. So, um, they do cross like a chip mat, but then we also have people who are doing manual timing, like, you know, bib number 10 past this point at, you know, 832.06 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you talked about how to keep feet warm. What about the rest of your body? <laughs> Fur or down? Oh, good question. Both? <laughs> um, so how to keep the rest of your body warm, how to dress. Um, we always dress in layers. I mean, it's just basic. In fact, on our website, we have a how to dress guide. I highly recommend it if you come out to the race. Um, you know, just that first layer is that wicking, like long underwear, especially great if you can have a wool or wool blend. And then we do a warmth layer. So I typically have my long underwear and then I'm wearing like fleece or a wool sweater. And then we have a windproof layer and that would be, um, kind of like a snow pant, but I want to really be able to move in it. I use a brand called Wintergreen, which is based out of Ely, Minnesota. That's where I grew up. I was friends with the family for years. And Sue Shirky outfitted Will Steger and her husband Paul Shirky on all of their Arctic expeditions. So highly recommend it. It's made in America. It's hand sewn and it's great. I mean, so that's what I'm like. I'm buying my fleece from them. I'm buying my wind pants from them. As far as a jacket, um, our whole board of directors is sponsored by Parajumpers through Bill, through Brightwater. Those are down parkas. And then we have like a fur ruff and a fur lined hood. And I can't tell you on a windy day, when you pull that up around your face, I mean, it's like I don't even need a stocking cap because that fur is really going to insulate and protect from the wind. So it seems like a lot of this sport is dog driven, like you have to love dogs. And, um, is, I don't know, for the average musher, is it, you know, because they love dogs first or is it a different love first? That's a great question. So asking about the sport being driven by a love of dogs or a different love, um, and I would say that, you know, mushers, I mean, if you don't love your dogs, you're not going to do well, right? This is a relationship. Um, these mushers, a lot of them have many, many dogs, 50 to 100 dogs in their kennel. I can tell you that they know not only their names, they know who their parents and grandparents were. They know their preferences with diet. They know their sore spots. They know where they're going to need to work on them after a run and maybe give them a little massage. I mean. They are so in tune with these dogs. It's incredible. I think it's this, you know, the passion of just like being a part of this like ancient way of life too. Like where, you know, I mean in Alaska, the, the exploration of Alaska took place because of, you know, a dog powered sled. Uh, so I think that there is probably more to that desire. I mean, I think for my dad too, um, Speed competition has always been a part of his, you know, I mean, he's raced cars and done other things. But what makes this unique is that 
you're not just getting you know, on a snowmobile with an engine. You are having to pour so much of your life into you know, raising this team and really you know, watching them succeed. And ultimately, I didn't spend a ton of time talking about the dogs, but they are the true heroes. I mean, these athletes are uncomparable in the animal world for the amount of um, distance they cover related to their size and the amount of weight that they pull. I mean, they are amazing animals. And everyone said last year, I'm so surprised by how friendly the dogs are. They are so friendly. I mean, if you go to any of our events, the mushers are happy to have you come up and the dogs will nuzzle you. They'll come up, they'll kiss you. They're, I mean, they're just very, very sweet dogs. There are some shy dogs, but in general, like these dogs are very loving. And so I think it does require that relationship. I mean, I, I personally can't think of a musher who would be out there like just bound and determined to win. Like it, it wouldn't even be possible because the dogs, like my dad had some lead dogs that wouldn't run for me. They were his dogs. I, I took care of them, I fed them, I spent tons of time with them, but that relationship between a musher and a lead dog, I mean, that's what it takes to win a race. I could run my dad's team in races, and I never placed where he placed because they were running for him. And so I don't think anyone really could compete in this sport without having that kind of relationship with their dogs. Anything else? How long does it take to prep a trail? How long does it take to prep a trail? Um, so we will go out on the lake in another week or two and do our first kind of survey of where things are at with pressure ridges and things like that. And then um, our trail boss will ride around the trail for about a week, day and night, um, taking breaks to fix the groomer. Yeah, it's, it's many, I mean, hundreds of hours. Um, we thankfully have more people on that team this year, but he literally did circles around the lake for about a week um, with very little rest. So, And you have to do it that close to the race because conditions change so much and there's snowmobile traffic. So we have to make sure that you know the, the trail is set and is not going to be like messed with, essentially. How many, how many uh, ice houses do you have to move? <laughs> how many ice houses? Well, I'm not. Oh, last year, I think we had to move Dean Phillips' ice house. He said, Dean, can you just scooch over a little bit? It's really close to the trail. Just kidding. <laughs> but there were a lot of really fun um, parties out on the lake last year. The mushers were raving about the crowds and about people handing them beer and here's a hot dog. I mean, they said it was the most fun that they'd had at a race in a long time. And that's something I should mention is the Klondike is very unique because most of these races take place in very rural areas that are hard to access. So the fact that we kind of bring you this experience right in your backyard. It's very easily accessible. It's unique for spectators as well as for the mushers. They don't get to do, I told them, I'm like, you guys get a tour of some of the most beautiful homes in the area, so enjoy it. I know you're out, not out in the middle of the woods, but you know, look around you, and they loved it. They had a great time. How many dogs do I have? At the moment, I don't have any. I lost um, a dog a year ago, but you know, it's funny because today my dad uh, sent me a message and we are going to be moving to a, a more rural spot. And he said, well, what do you think? Um, you know, I could, I could probably buy you like 10 dogs or something and I can help train them. And, you know, I, I'm thinking like I knew I was going to be coming here tonight and I'm like, I don't want to be there in a year and being like, well, now I'm back into the dogs. <laughs> Because it will just fulfill that prophecy that I said, where it's like you, you, you can check out, but you can't really ever leave the sled dog I think community. Your daughters deserve that uh, experience. I know, I know. That's what he said, too. This would be so good for the kids. Oh, man, guys. I don't know. Are you happy or are you excited about the uh, uh, talent that have registered for the race so far? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm kind of blown away, to be honest. Like, when I had the initial idea of, like, hey, let's bring a sled dog race. Like I pictured kind of a fun little community event. And the, I mean, the teams that we've drawn, and also, I don't know if anyone was around for this, but um, there's a man by the name of Brent Sass. He grew up here in Excelsior. He's a graduate of um, Minnetonka High School. And he has won the Yukon Quest like five times. That's the, another 1,000 mile race. He's placed very high in the Iditarod. He just won a 300 mile race up in Alaska today. 
he came back and he, he spoke on behalf of the Klondike uh, at schools around the area and helped us promote the race last year. So that was another one of those wow moments, right, where I got to meet one of these heroes of the mushing community who was so nice and so humble. And I guess I just never dreamed that this little idea of a sled dog race would turn into what it has and the potential. I mean, every day we're getting, you know, emails and things from people with some amazing ideas for ways that this can grow. And I think it will. And I'm really excited and just honored to be a part of it at this point. I mean, the team that has stepped up is also remarkable. Like, I'm a part of it, but I look at these guys and I'm like, oh my gosh, they have done so much work. There is so much talent there on the board of directors. And yeah, we're just really lucky that so many people in our community has really rallied around this. So, yeah. So uh, two years ago, there was a great crowd, and as you know, it was an absolute snowstorm that morning. Are you worried that there might be too many people if it's really nice out? Uh, yes. The question is, two years ago, there was a great crowd. Am I worried that too many people will show up if there's not a giant snowstorm? Um, yes. <laughs> we have doubled our um, busing service. Um, so. You know, I don't know. Someone said like, oh, are we worried about, you know, like where all the spectators will go? And I'm like, well, we do have like an entire lake. So I just figure everyone will just kind of keep pushing farther down the trail if they want a front row seat. There was another question back there. So did, uh, with, two years ago, did you help them with housing? That's a lot of people and, you know, coming down and what did they do? Yeah, the question is about housing two years ago and what did, what did mushers do? Um, some mushers just like know people in the area that they stayed with. Uh, we did offer host families, but a lot of mushers actually um, stayed at the, there's a Holiday Inn down by the Lifetime, and they graciously are hosting mushers again. I guess that they, they did a good job of being t neat and tidy. People think like, oh man, are they going to bring all the dogs in the hotel? No, they stay in the truck. Um, so yeah, they just stay at, at hotels or at friends' houses, yeah. I don't have a question, I just want to thank you. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> this is amazing. Tonight and, and two years ago when we went to it, my husband was worried I was going to buy 10 puppies. All of a <laughs> you could be like my dad. <laughs> the happiest, happiest days that we can imagine. And, and to bring this here is just wonderful. Well, thank you. Like I said, I'm truly just honored to be a part of it, and it's exciting to have the support that the race has had. So thank you. And if you ever, you know, want to get into it, just look me up. I can tell you who to talk to. <laughs> how large was the crowd in 2020? How large was the crowd? Um, so we've had, kind of had to estimate looking at drone photos, right? And we have a whole lake, you know, it's 20 miles of trail. I mean, we know it was more than 10,000. Um, if you count people also viewing online, I think we were like, we, I think we had about 5,000 people who were viewing online, and we figure like 20,000 is a, like a safe number in terms of people viewing. Some of those were online, but yeah, it was large. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. What is your favorite race you've ever yeah, favorite race that I've ever competed in. Um, so I competed in a race, oh, I don't even know what year, that would have been 2000 maybe. Uh, it's called the Midnight Run in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. We start at night and we run throughout the night. And uh, the UP is a pretty incredible place. I mean, snow, they don't ever have to worry about snow. There's tons of snow. And you're running throughout the night, and I mean, there's all these people out along the trail having parties. Like, they put luminaries out. They have bonfires. I mean, it's like 2 in the morning, and they're out there like, hey. And then you actually cross the finish line, like, as the sun is rising over the lake. I mean, it, it was just an incredible experience. So that would be my personal favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Any others? Is that it? All right, thank you so much. <laughs>